Yes, our God is a mountain mover, and you know what? He's still moving mountains every day. And the good news is he can move your mountains too. Hi there. This is Chuck Cooper, host of It's a God Thing radio program. Thank you for joining us today. We sure are glad you're here. You're about to listen to some awesome interviews with believers in Jesus Christ who will tell you how God has revealed and proved himself to them by moving mountains they were unable to move by themselves. They say that their stories can only be described as a God thing. Ready for a real blessing? All righty then, let's do this God thing. Well, we're pleased to be talking today by telephone with Caitlin Heinel, a 24-year-old young lady from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Caitlin has experienced the God in very unusual ways. She's experienced uh, his healing power, his love for her, his mercy for her, and his forgiveness for her. Uh, We're just delighted that Caitlin has uh, agreed to uh, share her incredible story. Uh, And by the way, folks, you may want to go ahead and uh, get some tissues handy. I have an idea. (laughs) I have an idea you're going to need them, and I may too. In fact, you might even want to call your next door neighbor and, uh, and tell them to listen in to what Caitlin has to say today. So welcome to our program today, Caitlin. Now, you have an incredible story. Tell us what's, what's going on with you. Okay, so in spring of 2016, I was diagnosed with an extremely rare GI vascular nervous system condition called SMA syndrome. And that stands for Superior Mesenteric Artery Syndrome. There are only 400 cases of it documented ever, but it's suspected that it's way more popular than that. It just goes undiagnosed for so long that people end up dying and they never even find out what the problem was to begin with. So when I was diagnosed, I was originally told that if I got a feeding tube, to um, regain the weight that I lost, that everything in my body would start working correctly again, well, and Caitlin, I would be Caitlin, fine. You said weight loss. How much weight loss uh, did you incur? Uh, probably around 40 pounds. Wow. Over like a nine-month nine period. <clears throat> so it wasn't incredibly rapid. Like I was eating the entire time trying to keep my weight up, but due to the condition, I was regurgitating all the food that I ate. So nothing or next to nothing of what I was consuming was being digested. It was just all coming back up immediately. Gosh, and and that that went on for about nine months? Yeah, before I got diagnosed. Good. And in that period of time, I saw probably 50 different doctors I had a number of tests done, I had blood work done, like nothing was coming back. And it took me getting admitted at the Cleveland Clinic for them to run a test that they actually did incorrectly in order to clinically diagnose me with this condition based on how I was presenting. My goodness. So, yeah, so they put a feeding tube in when I was at the Cleveland Clinic Um, It went down my throat and into my small intestine, so they completely bypassed my stomach. And the tube went on the other side of the blockage. So they were able, that was the only way that I could receive nutrition was if they bypassed my stomach and went to the other side of the blockage. And it was all liquid? It was all liquid nutrition? Yes, it was all, all through the tube. And so, because that's not the normal way that a body is meant to be fed, there are a whole lot of complications with feeding tubes. And I was willing to suck it up and deal with whatever those complications turned out to be if it meant that I would be fine, you know, eventually. I just need, they were saying maybe like three months with a feeding tube. My and every, everything would be okay. So I was like, I can deal with this for three months. So as it turns out, because um, my stomach wasn't the only problem, like my intestines didn't work properly, my pelvic floor muscles didn't work properly, everything was just a mess, I was dependent on laxatives in order for my bowels to move. My so if goodness. I didn't, So if I didn't take laxatives, then I'd be constipated. 
and then I wouldn't be able to tolerate the tube feed formula. And so because I was hooked up to the tube feed formula for close to 24 hours every day, I constantly needed to be near a bathroom. (laughs) So my quality of life was absolutely horrible. I couldn't, I felt horrible every single day. And I couldn't leave to go do anything because I needed to be near a bathroom. (laughs) So um, eventually, because I wasn't tolerating the tube feed formula at all, I wasn't gaining any weight on it at all. I was starving because it, due to it bypassing my stomach, my brain never got the signals that I was being fed. And so I, I was constantly hungry all the time. So I continued to eat and throw up because it didn't stay down. Regardless, of, like I knew when I ate that it was going to come back up, but I just didn't care because I just needed to taste food because I was so hungry. So um, in August of 2016, I made the decision to pull the feeding tube. Um, I had had it for like four to five months at that point, and we were no further ahead then when we started, we were actually probably further behind. Like I felt worse with the feeding tube than I did without it. So I told my mom that I was just done. I I said, if God wants to keep me here, then that's gonna be on him. I said I would continue to eat um, because I was still hungry. So even though I didn't think that really anything was getting through, definitely not enough to warrant me like still being alive. (laughs) I said that I would continue to do that as long as God wanted me to, but that when that wasn't enough, that I would die and that I would be completely at peace with that. My goodness, let me me interrupt you here, Caitlin. You're a very devout Christian girl. I, I already know that, but how did you come to know the Lord and how did you have the strength to endure what you had just been through? So in December of 2015 was when, because I got, started getting sick in um, the summer of 2015. And so by December of that year, I had reached a place where I just knew that I could not count on doctors to get me better. And so I actively started seeking out God's guidance in all of this and just praying that he would lead me to the correct doctor or like if I wasn't meant to get better, that he would help me be okay with that. Um, I didn't really understand what it meant to surrender to God until I pulled my feeding tube. Because I think at the beginning when I first started, I started listening to sermons every single night before bed. And that um, is something I still do today. So every night when I lay down in bed, I turn on a podcast on my phone and have listened to a 30-minute sermon before going to bed. And I have learned so much about the Bible from doing that. And that has been my quiet time with God because due to being sick, I wasn't able to go to church on the weekend. And so, you know, I had to bring church to me, which has been super helpful. But I definitely thought at the very beginning of my journey that I would, I decided what I wanted to happen and that I prayed God to get on board with what I had already made up my mind about. Yeah, that's like a lot of us do. (laughs) (laughs) And so when we were scheduling all the doctor's appointments and trying to find answers, it was like we were saying we were giving it to God, but really we were continuing to go at the problem the exact same way that we were. So I had just kind of reached a point where I was done with that. So when I pulled the feeding tube, I was like, I'm not going to go see another doctor. I'm not going to go have more blood work done. 
Like, I really don't care. I just want to enjoy whatever time um, I have left. And I'm going to trust that if God has a different plan for me, that he's going to make that happen. But I'm not going to actively be trying to take control of this anymore. And he did take care of it, too, didn't he? He did, in a huge way. <clears throat> so I pulled the feeding tube in August. And at that time, we thought that I would maybe have a couple weeks left to live, um, just based on the fact that I had been malnourished um, for over a year at that point. I was down to 65 pounds. My um, goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's not really a sustainable weight for a 24-year-old adult female. Um, but somehow, like my body continued to thrive and despite the fact that I was malnourished and that nothing in my entire GI tract worked properly at all. All of my other organs sustained no damage at all. My liver, my kidneys, my pancreas, my gallbladder, everything worked perfectly fine. My heart perfectly fine. So that's pretty much unheard of when you're you reach that level of malnourishment to not have your other organs start to malfunction. But by the grace of God, mine were fine. I was able to do quite a bit. Like we had nice weather in Ohio up until um, a week or two before Thanksgiving. I did a four mile walk with my mom. My goodness. Um, yeah. So uh, every night, like before bed, if I um, knew that we were going to have a nice day, the following day or whatever, and wanted to try to do a walk with my mom, I would just pray that, you know, God, could you please give me the energy to, like, do this tomorrow? Because at that point, my mindset was I want to push myself to do whatever I can because if I'm going to die... Like, I want to make the most of this time. Now, Caitlin, and sure at, enough, at this point, were you still uh, regurgitating any food you tried to keep down? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was eating over 30,000 calories every single day. 30,000? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of ice cream. Yeah. It is. Um, and it wasn't, we started with ice cream, and oh. then it, like, progressed. It was, like, ice cream and... The news story that they did in November showed all the food that I would eat in one day. Oh, my. It, yeah, it's a, it was a lot of food, and it's going to be a very long time, if ever, that I want to eat ice cream ever again. <laughs> You've had enough of that, huh? <laughs> yeah, because I have had so much ice cream that, like, just looking at Ben and Jerry's makes me sick. I bet. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, like, I did a ton of stuff. And then throughout this, um, the last six months or so, a pastor from a local church, Christ Community Chapel in Hudson, Ohio, uh, Joe Coffey, had been coming out to the house to see me every couple of weeks. And he's the main pastor whose sermons that I listen to before bed. Mm-hmm. So when he came to see me uh, in November, I told him that I felt like there was something else God wanted me to do, but I didn't know what that was, and that I would really appreciate if he could send me some flashing lights, because I was like, I can't guess anymore. I, I really have no idea what he wants me to do, but I just know that there is something. So he started praying that God would reveal that to me. I started praying God would re would reveal that to me. And sure enough, what ended up happening out of all of that was WKYC, a local news station, did a story on my condition. And I had reached out um, to Monica Robbins, and I told her, I said, I was a, I'm 24 years old, I have this terminal condition, and I feel like it's my obligation to raise awareness about it because nobody in the medical community has any idea what they're talking about when it comes to this. People are having surgeries. 
They're getting the runaround. They're ending up worse. And it's just absolutely devastating. And if my life is going to end, I want to make sure that I do everything I can so that way nobody else has to make the decision that I did at 24 years old. That's very mature for 24 years old, Caitlin. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that. So she um, she went and told the story to her producers, and they were on board, and they came out, and they did the story. It aired on the news, and a week and a half later, I got an email from a man named Philip Keller, and he used to be on the radio in the 90s um, under the alias Trapper Jack. And he emailed me, and he said, I never watch the news, but I happened to turn on the news um, the night that my story aired, and I saw you on TV, and yeah, I just he, felt... He just happened to turn it on, right? Yeah, <laughs> and that was the, what the craziest thing was, because when we were talking about it at home, because um, he is actually very good friends with Dr. Naney. And I was telling my mom, I said, I really don't think that he sits around watching the news, scouting out people to send to this doctor. You know, the only explanation would be that it was a God thing. And he happened to turn on the news that night and saw me. So he emailed me and said, "Um, have you ever heard of Dr. Naimi? He uh, has a gift or not, he doesn't have a gift of healing. God works through him to heal people. Thousands of miracles have come out of, of his office. And he gives all the credit to God. He does not claim that, that anything that happens in there is by his own doing. But God uses him. And so um, I had never heard of him. I Googled him. And immediately when I got to his um, website, I just knew that that God was leading me there. Um, I can't explain it any other way than just a feeling inside that I was going to go see this doctor and it was going to change my life. So we called to set up an appointment and we got on a waiting list. And we, so we did not have an appointment date at all, just on the list. So I emailed um, Mr. Keller back and I thanked him for getting us in touch with Dr. Naney. And I told him that we were on the wait list. And I asked him, like, and, like, do you know how often they get cancellations? Because he's a one man business. So you can imagine that with the number of people trying to get in to see him, the cancellations happen pretty much never. Yeah, right. So so Philip emailed me back, and he said, it's often a God thing, but it'll happen. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes after my mom um, had called to get me on the wait list, we got a call back that there was a cancellation. 10 minutes? 10 minutes. My goodness. And and I got an appointment for December 9th, which was one week from when we made the phone call. My goodness. My goodness. And so, you know, only an act of God could have had all of that be set in motion. So we went to the appointment, and I came home from that appointment and kept food down for the first time. In 16 months. Repeat that again. I'm not sure I understood what you said. So we went to the appointment and we came home and I kept food down for the first time in 16 months. After one session with this doctor? One session. Praise prior the Lord. To my, prior to my first appointment, I couldn't even keep plain chicken broth down. If it had calories, it was coming back up. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, so for me to come home and be able to sit at the kitchen table and eat and have it not come back up instantaneously. I mean, before, if I took one or two bites of food, it was already starting to come back up. So I was able to eat, like, an entire meal and keep it down and was completely fine. 
good gracious. And that was after yeah. one that was after one session with him. Yeah. Yeah, just one appointment. Now did he and have all, the, did he have all your medical records? Did you take those to no. him? No. No? No. Okay. No. I filled yeah. out when I got there, I filled out one piece of paper. It had maybe five questions on it and like one of those questions was my name. So the stuff that he needed to know was very minimal. I did not have to bring my big binder with all of my blood work and tests and all this stuff. Um, the only thing that it asked, I'm pretty sure, about my medical history was what I was diagnosed with. Uh -huh. And honestly, most of the doctors didn't want to put a label on what I had because it was so, so multifaceted that one diagnosis didn't encompass it all. There was so much wrong that it's like I didn't just have SMA syndrome or I didn't just have a paralyzed stomach. I had this and this and this and this and there isn't one word right. that right. covers it all. <clears throat> so I just put down SMA syndrome because I figured like that sounds good enough. Yeah. And and he really didn't uh, care. Like, we didn't talk about that. He didn't ask, you know, how many doctors, doctors did you see? What prior tests did you have done? We didn't talk about that at all. That, it, it didn't matter to him. didn't affect what God can do through him. And so you primarily prayed? Um, he prayed. But in his office appointment, he does this type of acupuncture. And I always struggle to explain it to people because as far as I know, he's the only person in the world that uses the techniques that he uses. And to be perfectly honest, if you went into an appointment and didn't have faith in God, and then he started doing this acupuncture and some of the other therapies he does, you would be like, there is no way that any of this crazy stuff that he's doing is going to result in me coming home and keeping food down. Okay, let, 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 me, let me ask you a question here, and, and I keep interrupting you, but let me ask you a question here. What did you think? What were your thoughts when uh, you realized what this doctor was going to do, that you're going to get some acupuncture and he was going to pray for you? How, how did, what did you think about that? Um, I didn't have any reservations about it at all. I was very confident going into the appointment. Like the, like I said, my appointment was on Friday. And Thursday night, I told my brother, I was like, this is going to be the last night that I spend throwing up in my room. My like goodness. I, and he looked at me and he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll see. And I just think everybody else was very afraid to get their hopes up because it's huge. And it would be obviously very devastating if we had gone to the appointment and stuff had gone differently. But I just knew in my heart that God would not lead me to this person if he didn't intend to do something big. So I was very open to whatever it was that he was going to do at the appointment. I didn't know what to expect, but I was definitely on board with it, and I didn't question it or whatever, sure. but I could definitely see how somebody who didn't have that level of faith would struggle to make the connection of how it would be possible. Yes. <clears throat> oh, boy. So, so you've had one treatment with him, or have you seen him since? seen him since. I've had two more office appointments, and then I have gone to two of his healing services. So where we're at right now is I can keep breakfast down every day. So that's a lot of progress. And then my intestines have woken back up, so they're working properly for the first time in 12 years. Um, <clears throat> my energy levels have picked up a lot. Uh, just in the past couple of days, I've been able to take my puppy on walks by myself. And he's a 75 pound Labrador retriever. So he's pretty strong. And 
I'm able to hold my own with him and be outside and do that. Is that... Um, is that the same dog that uh, you posted a picture of on Facebook where you were both jumping up and down on a bed or a couch? Yes, yes, that would be him. <laughs> I was able to, that particular day, I was able to run around the house with him. And I have not been able to do that since we got him because of how much this has zapped my energy. We brought him home in January of last year. And so I was pretty in the thick of being sick yes, right. at that point. And we obviously had no idea how much worse things were going to get. Right. Uh, but I feel really, really good most days. Now, like before when I was regurgitating the food, it was an all-day event. And I would be throwing up for up to two hours after the last time I put food in my mouth. So if I stopped eating at 9 p.m., I would be up until 11, 11.30, still throwing up. Oh, boy. So, yeah, it was, a long, it was a long day. And it was 12 hours of being in the eating, regurgitating cycle every single day. Like, I did not do anything else other than eat and throw up. That was my day. Oh, man, so, oh, man. Yeah, it was uh, pretty crazy. So now, um, with breakfast staying down, that's really awesome. And it gives me a lot of energy to go from having no nutrition to having one entire meal. And then the rest of the day, um, I still eat again. <laughs> but when I regurgitate it, it doesn't take me as long to do it. <laughs> so it doesn't hamper my entire day anymore. Um, Dr. Nini is very confident that it's all going to be resolved, and I'm very confident in that as well. He was actually just talking about at his most recent healing service this past Sunday that sometimes God slows the healing process down when he's trying to push a person to reach another level in their faith <clears throat> and I really felt like that was me and that he's doing that for me because he's talked to Dr. Naomi has talked about how atheists people of different religions have come to his office and that God doesn't withhold healing based on your beliefs that sometimes God uses a miraculous healing to bring people into the faith. And so people like that may need an instantaneous healing because their faith is, because they don't have faith to begin with. Yes. So if you make them wait on it, then you're going to lose them. Well, that's how but God for, that's that's how God works, Caitlin. And uh, you yes. you're a primary example, a great example. Of how uh, how faith in God, how submission to God, how dependence on God, how trusting on God is starting to heal you. And it's just being patient for all the pieces to come together. Like for me, I think that he, or I hope he knows that I'm already all in. So if it's going to take a little bit of time for everything to come together, that's not going to change my level of faith. I'm not going to question whether or not it's going to happen. I fully believe that everything is going to be 100% resolved sooner rather than later. But just the progress that has been made in one month to go from really thinking and believing that his plan for me was to die to have this radical change in plans where I'm on a path to healing is just incredible to me. Absolutely. Caitlin, uh, I want to ask you, um, uh, I didn't alert you that I was going to ask you to do this, but there are many, many people who are suffering from disease, uh, yes. ter terminal diseases, many, many yes. diseases, and some of them probably listening to our program today. What advice would you give based on your experience, to people who are suffering and facing um, 
certain death. Well, we all face certain death until the, unless the Lord comes first. But what advice would you give to folks? Comfort them and make them feel better. I honestly think that listening to the sermons every night before bed or finding some way to connect to God that's meaningful to you is the best thing that I did when I thought that the plan was for me to die. Coming into a better understanding of what heaven is, that became very important to me because when you think that your life on earth is coming to an end, you definitely want to make sure that you're right with God and that you understand. I I had a lot of questions about what heaven is and what, I don't know, to expect with that. And I read this book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn, and I really liked it, and it explained heaven in a much clearer way than I had had it explained before. And it just brought me a really great sense of peace about the entire experience of dying and just have, you know, if you know Jesus, death is just a threshold into eternal life, that this life isn't all that there is. And so there's not a reason to be afraid of going home. Oh, that, well, that's that's a mighty word. That's a mighty testimony, uh, Caitlin. And just a personal note, I've read Dr. Alcorn's book four times. Have you really? Yes, I have. It was it was it was presented to me several years ago, and every time I read it for the next three or four weeks, my daily prayer is, Lord, please let Mr. Alcorn be correct. Please let this be true. <laughs> Because it's so good, what we have in front of us. We just can't imagine. Exactly. And that's what I, you know, we weren't created for this broken world. That's true. And And to just know that there is so much to look forward to. Because my biggest thing was that if God wanted all of us to have long lives on earth, the devastating health conditions that are out there, the murders and things that just go on in this world, they just wouldn't exist because he would want us to be here as long as possible. Correct. And so the the fact that things happen and that there isn't a cure for every single thing and that sometimes people, you know, accidents and things just happen that take people's lives is proof that this just isn't all that there is. Caitlin, I really appreciate your willingness to share this very personal story, and I've got two more. I've got two more questions for you, though, before I let you go. Number one: Would you say that all that has happened to you is really a God thing? A hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the last question I have for you is, Caitlin, would you please uh, keep us up to date with what's going on uh, with you? And I'd like to I'd like to do a follow up when uh, you feel like you're healed or totally healed. Would you Absolutely. Uh, would you be willing to do that? And uh, Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin. We'll I'll continue to pray for you daily like I have been since I heard your story. And uh, Thank you so much. Okay, well thank you and the Lord continue to bless you, Caitlin. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Wow, what a great half hour this has been. It's our hope that you have been inspired, encouraged, awed, and intrigued by what you heard today. We earnestly pray that hearing these stories as a regular listener to our program will be a source of hope and encouragement to you, that these stories will strengthen your faith in God and will lead you to a closer walk with Jesus. Whether you are a believer in Jesus Christ or a not yet believer, we pray that you will reflect on the God thing excellence in your own life and conclude that it was God at work and that he was knocking on your door. If you have a God thing story of your own, or you know someone who does, we'd love to hear about it. Just email a brief summary to mystory at itsagodthingradio.com. That's mystory at itsagodthingradio.com. Or you can call us at 770-500-2400. See you next time. 